In this chapter, we're talking about intervals. Intervals are the distance between two notes. Now, if you took theory and beyond, you will learn how to identify them by ear, by listening to them as well. But we're just going to be identifying them by sight and learning how to draw them and notate them ourselves. So there are two different types of intervals. The first being harmonic interval, which is when there are two different notes that sound at the exact same time. They're often stacked on top of each other like this. So those two notes, if this were treble clef, that F and that A would sound at the exact same time, whereas melodic, the F and the A sound at separate times, one after the other, more like a melody, whereas the top one is played or sung in harmony. Two different terms we're going to learn are unison, which is the exact same note. Basically, if this was two voice parts or two different instruments, they'd be playing the exact same pitch. On the piano, it would be the same key, one after the other. Whereas an octave, if this were treble clef, would be one F to the next F. Or if this were an A in bass clef, to the next A. So there are eight notes, not just the exact same pitch. All right, in our interval chapter, the first thing we're going to talk about are generic intervals, which are just the numeric names. Now, we just learned unison, and after that, we're going to have seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, sevenths, and then that eighth is the octave. There are intervals larger than that, but we're just learning those within the octave. The way that we're going to figure those out is basically just by counting from the bottom note up to the top note either by the letter name or by how many lines or spaces are in between those notes. So C, D, E, F, and G, that makes up five notes. We're counting from the first line in the first space up to the top no line or space. So that C to that G, it started down here. C, that's one. D would be two. E is three. F would be four. G would be my fifth. Let me give you some more examples. If we started on F and we wanted to go up a third, F would be one, G would be two, A would be three. If we wanted to start on E and go up a sixth, E one, F two, G three, four, five, and now I'm on C as my sixth. So that should be hopefully pretty clear to you. Just don't forget to always start at counting on that first note that you're on. So if I'm on D as my starting note, I have to count my that D as my one, because that if that were next to each other, that'd be my one or my unison. That'd be my second. That would be my third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, up to the octave. That'd be from one D to the next D up. Now my slide question says what would the numerical or generic interval be from C to F? We'll count C, D, E, F and how many fingers is that? Or if you looked at it on the staff you would look at C, D would be 2, E would be 3, there's my 3, F would be my fourth, so that would be four, and that'd be a, called a fourth as far as our generic interval goes. The next slide is a chart of all the generic intervals. So we have unison here, same exact note. There's your second, there's your third. Now these are all the C as a starting note. There's your fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and there's C to C, there's your octave. Remember, the generic interval name is nonspecific. That's just the number. doesn't have a specific quality of major or minor. We're also going to learn augmented and diminished and perfect later. If you're asked for the generic, it's just that, just the number. So if you're comfortable with generic intervals, you might want to go ahead and proceed on to Lesson 18, which is the first interval worksheet of your homework. For those of you in my online class, it's asking you just the numeric interval, the generic interval, and go ahead and identify that. After you have that down, let's proceed on and go to the major diatonic intervals, which we're going to learn major and perfect intervals next. So within the major scale, that means when we think about the interval, we think about the bottom note as kind of being the keynote or the tonic, 
when that top note is a note that would fall within whatever that major scale would be, we're going to call that either major or perfect. And let me show you that on Notepad. Actually, I'm going to show you it over here real quick. So what that means is, now in this first one, there's no flats, no sharps, we're in the key of C. So C to C, we're calling that a perfect unison. C to D, we call that a major second. All unisons in a major key are perfect. All seconds are always major. Thirds are major. C to E is major. Now you'll notice fourths from C to F, that's called perfect. Now that's just a musical term. It has to do with the pitch quality, etc. It's not because it's perfect and, you know, the best interval ever. It just means that it's perfect. Just memorize that term. C to F is a perfect fifth. I mean C to G, sorry about that. So fifths within the major scale are always perfect. Major sixth in the key of C, if you think of C as the bottom note being the key, that's going to be C to A is my major. C to B is my major seventh. Last, we have a perfect octave. Now you'll notice these terms don't change no matter what key we're in or think really about just that bottom note as being your keynote. So over here, if we're in the key of A, A to A is my perfect unison. A to B is the major second. Now, when we get to this major third, that's actually A to C sharp because in the key of A, we have a F, a C, and a G sharp. So A to C sharp is my major third. Okay, A to D is my perfect fourth. A to E is a perfect fifth. When we get to this major sixth, that's actually an A to an F sharp because in the key of A, we have an F sharp. So that top note, as it falls in the major scale, has a sharp on it. When you get over to the major seventh in the key of A, if A is your bottom note and you think of A being your key, G would have a sharp on it because in the key of A, G would be sharped. Works the same way in our flat key down here, which is our key of E flat. E flat to E flat's unison. E flat to F's my second. E flat to G's my third. E flat to what would this top note be? In our key over here, we already know, since it's written right here, that it has an A flat. If it was not written here, which it will not be on your homework, you would need to think about the key of E flat or look at your circle of fifths, or we'll learn how to do it through using the scale pattern in a minute. But that would be an E to an A flat as my perfect fourth. E to B flat is the perfect fifth. E to C is the major sixth. E to D is the major seventh. And E flat to E flat is the perfect octave. So going back up here, the things we need to memorize are that when, again, when that interval falls in the major scale, meaning when the top note is the note that's in the major scale, thinking of the bottom note as the keynote, It'll make more sense to you, I think, when I show you on the board in the second video. But anyway, just memorize that. The ones that are called perfects are fourths, fifths, octaves, and unisons. Always are perfect when they're in the major scale. They're never major fourths, major fifths, major octaves, no. Later, we will learn how to make them augmented and diminished, but right now, forget I even said that. At the bottom, notice, notice that major intervals Within the major scale, the ones that we call major are seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevenths. So this is just a memorization thing. Now, how do you know whether it falls in the major scale and how are you going to do that? That's what I'm going to show you real quick. And I'll show you that in more detail when I make the video for the chapter that I will post later. So when it says how to build intervals, on this slide, this shows you the way that you can do it by using the half and whole step pattern. So we remember we walked home when we walked home, right? That's the major scale pattern. If you're thinking about the first scale degree or the tonic as being the bottom note of your interval, you can use this major scale pattern to find all of the major and perfect intervals. So if you go up a whole step, that takes you to the second scale degree, which is your major second. If you go up whole plus whole from the bottom note, it's going to take you to the major third. If you go whole, whole, half, that takes you to the perfect fourth. That's why that capital P is there. If you go whole, whole, half, whole, it takes you to the perfect fifth. 
etc. Down at the bottom, this chart is useful for some students who just like to refer to it or even memorize it. This just is really a condensed version of this whole half step pattern. Because if you think about it, a whole step or a major second, a whole step is the same thing as two half steps. Whole plus whole is the same thing as four half steps, etc. So this is just if you just want to count half steps to make your life easy. The other way, as I was showing you earlier, was by thinking about the key signature or by thinking about your circle of fifths. So if we go to finale, oop, not that one. Donut. Okay. So if we go over here, let's do some examples and thinking about it as far as we'll do it both ways, either key signature way or whole whole half way. So if we started on the on F and I wanted to build a perfect fourth. Now I didn't say just a fourth. Just a fourth we could do first though. One, two, three, four. Okay, except I didn't just say build a fourth. I said a perfect fourth, which means that that top note has to fall in the major scale. If you know what's in the key of F, meaning do you know in the key of F does that B have a flat on it or a sharp on it or is it a natural note? If you know already what that B might or might not have on it, you could go ahead and mark that. And if not, you can look at your circle of fifths and you can refer to that. Or you can go over here and think, okay, we need a perfect fourth. So we need to go whole, whole, half up from that F. So if we go whole, up from F, that would take us to G. If we go another whole, that would take us up to A. When we then go half, that takes us up to B, what? B flat. So the perfect fourth up from F is going to have that B flat on there. And if you already knew that because you might have memorized that the key of F has a B flat in it, you could just do it that way. Let's do another one. We're going to do one from the key of or from the starting note of E. Oops, that would be too many beats in the measure. So from the starting note of E, if we need a major third, the first thing I want you to do is just put your generic third up there. Okay, so we know it's a G something. That's the third. It's either going to be a G just like that, it's going to be a G flat, or it's going to be a G sharp. And if you remember that the key of E only has sharps in it, because it's not a flatted tonic, you might know that it's really only a natural or a sharp are the only options really. So if you know that, think about the key of E or look at your circle of fifths and think, hey, what's sharp in the key of E? Is that G sharp in the key of E? Do, 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 you tell me. But if you don't know or you don't feel like looking right now, you know I'm going to tell you. But let's look over here at this chart. We're looking for a major third. So we need to go whole step, whole step. So when we start on E and we go up a whole step, what do we end up on? We actually end up on F sharp because between E and F, those are two white keys, right? So we're on F sharp. When we go up another whole step, we're on G sharp. So I need to put, ooh, what am I doing? I need to put a sharp over here. Sorry about that, guys, but this is about take number four, so I'm not doing it over again. <laughs> so E to G sharp, that's going to be my major third. All right, let's do a couple more and then you're going to be on your own, but I think you're going to be able to do it. So let's do one from, how about from plain old, plain old F. No, that's not what I'm like. Why are you doing that? I think it's like stuck or something. Okay then, well we'll just do it from a sharp note. Oh, there we go. Ignore that brief moment right there of you can watch me struggling with finale. Sorry about that. All right, let's do one from, how about from A, and we want to do a perfect fifth up from A. So let's first count up A, B, C, D, E. That's going to be a fifth. 
Now we need to think about the key of A. Is there an E sharp or flat or anything in the key of A? Look at your circle of fifths. You can decide whether you need to put anything up there or go back and refer over here and think about perfect fifth. We need to go whole, whole, half, whole. And if you do all of that, if you start on A and you go up whole, whole, half, whole, you're going to end up on plain old E. So there's no nothing flat or sharp on there. Now, on the other hand, if we started on a flat, it's going to be a little bit different now, okay? If we need a perfect fifth up from a flat and you go, well, first of all, you can think about the key of A flat. And if you look at your circle of fifths, you can think what's flat in the key of A flat. And I can tell you right now, it's B, E, A, and D flat. And if you already have your fifth up there, so first, like I said, put that generic fifth up there so you know that it's in, the fifth is an E something and the perfect fifth's an E something. It's either going to be flat, sharp, or whatever. Since A flat is your tonic note, you know that it's a flat key, so it's not going to be a sharp. So the only option is either going to be this E or it could have a flat on it. Once again, look at your circle of fifths. B, E, A, and D are flat, so you would know that you would need to put a flat on there to call this a perfect fifth. The other thing to do, remember, is to go up whole, whole, half, whole. And if you do that accurately, that's the exact same thing down here as seven half steps, remember? When you go up seven half steps, you're going to get that E flat that we just wrote in when we were in our notepad. So hopefully that gives you a good start as far as figuring out your major and your perfect intervals. Remember, think about the bottom note as being your key, and then you're basically trying to figure out if you need to figure out a third, you're trying to figure out the third scale degree. If you're trying to figure out a perfect fourth, you're trying to figure out the fourth scale degree. If you're trying to figure out a fifth, a perfect fifth that is, you're trying to figure out the fifth scale degree. Always thinking of the bottom note as the keynote. Now, on the homework examples where the interval is already there for you, how are you going to figure that out? Well, the first thing you're going to do is just count. So if you need to figure out what this is, you're going to count one, two, three, four, five, and that's going to tell you that that's a fifth. If it's on the worksheet where you're having to identify the quality, you just need to remember that a fifth is a fifth major or is a fifth something else. A fifth is perfect. So don't forget that when you're identifying them by their quality as well as quantity, meaning kind of like the um, adjective, meaning whether it's perfect or major, and then the noun or whatever being the generic number, just remember that perfects are the unisons, fourths, fifths, and octaves. Stay tuned for the video where I'll show you th this on the staff and demonstrate this, and hopefully you'll get a good grasp of intervals before we move on to the second part of the chapter next week where we're going to be modifying these major and perfect intervals because sometimes in a song it's not always just going to be the notes within the scale. You're sometimes going to have notes outside the scale. So go on ahead and feel free to ask any questions on your last two homework assignments which are about major and perfect intervals.